Good morning and uh, welcome to the Standing Committee on Health and Social Development. Today is Wednesday, February 7th, uh, 2024. Um, the Standing Committee on Health and Social Development is charged with matters concerning health, social programs, uh, sports seniors, justice, public safety, emergency measures, Indigenous Affairs, Francophone and Acadian Affairs, Status of Women, Persons with Disabilities, Housing, Charities, the Prince Edward Island Human Rights Commission, and all other matters relating to health and social development. So um, we'll begin with, um, we should, uh, sorry, I should mention all of the people that are here. Um, today joining us we have Hilton McLennan, Robin Croucher, Gord McNeely, the Honorable Hal Perry, Peter Bevan Baker, uh, Peter Bevan Baker, and Carla Bernard. Um, we'll start with getting. Can I have a motion to adopt the agenda? Thank you, Robin. Okay. This morning we have UPEI uh, Medical School. No, the Faculty of Asso Association. Faculty Association. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Margot Rizinski. Raiskin, Raiskin, and Dr. Michael Arfkin. Um, so thank you for coming today to present to us. We're looking forward to hearing um, your thoughts and your presentation. Um, I will um, stop in a second and allow you a moment to introduce yourselves, and we'll you can carry on with your presentation after that. So thank you, and the mic is yours. All right. Thank you, and good morning. Thank you all for having us here. I am Margot Raiskind. I'm the executive director of the UPI Faculty Association, and I'm here today with my colleague, Dr. Michael Arfkin, who is our president. Um, we want to thank you for inviting us to speak here today, and we want to begin by saying that um, although we know that there are a lot of different perspectives in this room, we do understand that everyone is here with the same goal, which is to, to find a way to a strong university and a strong health system. Um, we want to be clear that the Faculty Association does not oppose the establishment of a medical school at UPI in principle. Um, but we have concerns about how the project is being approached at this time, and we recognize that the stakes here are very high for both uni the university and the health system, and so we do feel that it is important to get it right. And so we uh, extra appreciate you inviting us to give you our perspective. Uh, both Mike and I have things to say, so I'm going to let Mike start. Great. Thank you very much. My name is Dr. Michael Arfkin, and I am the President and Chief Grievance Officer for the UPEI Faculty Association, which is the union that represents all UPEI faculty members, sessional instructors, clinical nursing instructors, and clinical veterinary instructors. For the last 10 years, I've been involved in a range of activities, from enforcing the terms of our collective agreement and working to protect the health and safety of our campus community, to preparing for collective bargaining and leading the recent strike to improve our working conditions and our students' learning conditions. In addition, to, in addition to my local role with the UPEI Faculty Association, I also serve on the Executive Committee of the Canadian Association of University Teachers, which is the national voice for 72,000 Canadian academic teachers, librarians, researchers, and other academic professionals at some 125 universities and colleges across the country. I also serve as the chair of the CAUT Academic Freedom and Tenure Committee, which is tasked with advising the CAUT Executive Committee on policy matters relating to academic freedom and tenure, grievances and discrimination, and other issues related to potential infringements of academic rights. Before I begin, I would like to briefly highlight the importance of academic freedom in this context. Congruent with post-secondary institutions across the country, my academic freedom protections ensure that I have the freedom to criticize my employer without fear of institutional reprisal. I emphasize this because this is not a protection that many other workers enjoy, both at our institution and in other sectors. As such, I believe this negotiated right carries with it a responsibility to speak openly and honestly about matters which too often remain behind closed doors. We have been invited before the Standing Committee to share the UPEI Faculty Association's perspective on the UPEI Medical School, including any potential challenges with the current plan. To be perfectly honest, I find it difficult to describe what has transpired so far as resembling a plan. If plans are preceded by the collection of information, the weighing of consequences, and meaningful consultation with relevant stakeholders, then it is difficult to call what we have before us a plan. Instead, we have seen construction begin on a multi-million dollar building and the hiring of new staff for a medical school well before the completion of the first report 
on the integration of the medical school with the rest of the island health system. That report, which we had to obtain from Health PEI rather than UPEI, calls into question the ability of the medical school to function without creating additional barriers for islanders seeking medical care. The fact that this study was not completed prior to initiating this project, or that the UPI Board of Governors or UPI Senate do not appear to be receiving all the information they need to oversee this project, is also deeply concerning. Equally concerning is the UPEI administrative structure that is currently in place to implement this project. In 2022, the UPI Faculty Association sounded the alarm about the unprecedented number of interim or acting administrators employed at our institution. These are temporary administrators who have not gone through a formal hiring process or quality assessment and therefore lack a mandate to do more than keep the institution in working order pending a formal and transparent hiring process. At that time, we noted that over half of UPI deans and senior administrators were serving in an interim or acting basis, and that in some cases, individuals had served in those roles for a number of years. Today, those numbers remain largely unchanged, while the number of people serving in an acting or interim role in our most senior positions has actually increased. While there is no doubt that this precarious administrative structure has compromised our ability to function as an institution, Islanders have nonetheless been asked to put their faith in UPI administration's ability to navigate the challenging task of running a new medical school, a task that nearly everyone recognizes would be difficult under the best of circumstances. This is but one example of why I think the debate over the UPI medical school is, sorry, excuse me, this is but one example of why I think the debate over whether the UPI medical school is a good or bad idea largely misses the point. Over the last decade, UPEI has excelled in generating good ideas. But when the dust settles and the cameras are turned off, time and again we've seen these new initiatives mismanaged, under-resourced, and faculty and staff left to fend for themselves. As the recent Reuben Tomlinson report makes clear, the result is a collection, a collection of toxic working environments that are unable to recruit new faculty or administrators, in some instances struggling to meet accreditation requirements, and failing to provide the courses that students need to complete their programs. The lesson to take away is that good ideas are simply not enough. They take collaborative planning and research well before their implementation and a commitment to accountability and transparency from implementation to execution. To date, I have not seen anything to suggest that the UPI Medical School remotely approaches that standard. Don't Islanders deserve better? If we move past the debate on whether the medical school is a good idea and reflect on the concrete reality underlying this ambitious project, it is difficult to avoid the numerous red flags that have emerged since its inception. For example, at the recent town hall on the future of the Prince County Hospital made clear, recruiting healthcare workers is of little value if we have not created the working conditions for retaining the people that work in our healthcare system. Island workers face unprecedented levels of abuse from their employers, while government too often turns a blind eye. For years, the UPI Faculty Association has spent countless hours trying to encourage UPI administration to meet its obligations under the PEI Occupational Health and Safety Act. After numerous engagements with the PEI Workers' Compensation Board and our elected officials, it has become clear that government too often views its role as first and foremost to create a favorable environment for employers rather than addressing the increasing toxicity that workers encounter on a daily basis. My engagements with other island workers, including workers in healthcare, make it clear that this, is, this state of affairs is not isolated to UPEI. Make no mistake, recruitment is irrelevant if we are not prepared to create the conditions to retain workers. To date, creating those conditions has largely fallen on organized labor, who too often face employers steadfastly resisting these improvements. Enabling workers to exercise their own expertise in a healthy and safe workplace not only increases their dignity and self-respect, but also fosters the sort of community that is vital for both healthcare work and post-secondary education. If we are not prepared to make significant changes to the way we treat and support island workers, the prospects for healthcare, post-secondary education, and a range of other sectors of the island economy will remain dim. In short, the way we treat people matter. Whether it's faculty trying to deliver a world-class education or healthcare workers providing medical care, recruitment efforts are meaningless if we are not creating a supportive environment for island workers. During the UPI strike last year, our members fought to improve their working conditions and their students' learning conditions. 
We faced an employer that spared no expense to demonize UPEI academic staff and to drive a wedge between teachers committed to their students and the students who are the future of this island. If this is the environment that, environment that UPEI academic staff faced and continue to face on a daily basis, what are the prospects for medical education at our institution? In previous meetings of this committee, you've asked presenters to explain what elected officials can do to address these concerns. Given the importance of ensuring, ensuring that post-secondary institutions remain autonomous from government interference or direction, this is a particularly important question. First and foremost, it is important to recognize that UPEI is both an educational institution and a workplace. Declining to hold the employer accountable for taking reasonable steps to protect the health and safety of our workplace ensures that recruiting and retaining workers will remain a perpetual uphill battle. Of course, any of these issues from our precarious administrative structure to the toxic working environment identified in the Reuben Tomlinson report should on their own give us pause in moving forward with such a, 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 a project of such magnitude. As we are dealing with all of these issues and more simultaneously, it is reasonable for Islanders to question the judgment of those who are unwavering in their commitment to this medical school. Once again, good ideas are simply not enough. Projects of this scope must be well-planned, transparent, and robust enough to withstand reasonable critique. To date, I have seen no evidence to suggest that this is the case with the UPEI Medical School. While I appreciate that Islanders have come to view the UPEI Faculty Association as a legitimate and trustworthy source of information on island post-secondary education, I remain concerned that UPI administration has yet to appear before this committee to answer reasonable and pressing questions about this ambitious project. If UPI administration is confident that they are following an evidence-based approach and they have nothing to hide from Islanders, why have they not appeared before the committee to present that evidence and respond to questions? What are they waiting for? In closing, I have no doubt that everyone in this room is committed to improving Islanders' access to health care and supporting post-secondary education in our province. To date, we have been led to believe that we can establish a UPEI Faculty of Medicine without sacrificing those commitments. But we have been asked to believe this without evidence and by individuals who acknowledge that they still have significant work to do to regain the trust of the island and university community. How can we be comfortable placing the health and education of our children, spouses, parents, and friends on such a feeble and uncertain foundation? Thank you. So in your letter of invitation, um, you asked us to tell you about the impacts of the establishment of a medical school at UPEI from the faculty association perspective and including potential challenges. And um, this seems like a fairly easy thing to do, but in reality is quite difficult for us to do. And that's for one single reason, and that is that we know almost nothing about the plan for this medical school, and we're not sure who does know anything. Very little has been made public, very little has been committed to writing. Almost everything that we know about the plan for the medical school, we've gleaned from media comments. Um, so to prepare for this, I went through the archives at cbc.ca. Um, and when updates are given at the university, they are rarely uh, accompanied by written documentation. We are always, always going by what somebody has said in a meeting. Um, which makes it very difficult for us to understand what it is that we are expecting to have an impact on, on our members and on our university. Now, this lack of transparency and with it lack of accountability is unfortunately not unusual at UPEI, um, but it is unusual in the post-secondary sector and it is unusual in the establishment of medical schools recently. And I'd like to show you an example of what I'm talking about and my slides are out of order because that's who I am as a person. Uh, so I'll just bring you forward. Um, so what I've got for you here, these are just screenshots. I didn't do any deep research here. Um, but these, this is a screenshot from the Toronto Metropolitan University website for their upcoming School of Medicine. And I chose them because they are roughly on our timeline. They announced in 2021. Um, although they, um, they had secured the funding and they had a, a public agreement with uh, the government of Ontario already at that point, so clearly there was work previously done. Um, but, and they are slated to take their first uh, set of students in 2025. So we're looking at, at a group who should be basically in the same place we are at this time. Um, 
the first thing you see there, uh, they're, you know, they've got a little little blurb, but you'll notice their clinical partner. They have, a, they have a clinical partner with a memorandum of understanding and an understanding how that partner will support the clinical learning for the medical school. Uh, it is n not only not clear that that's the case in our, I I at UPEI, but it does seem very much as though it is not the case. And there are a lot of questions still to be answered there. Um, they have their mission. They have an EDI statement for the medical school um, and, and a vision. It's nice and clear. Um, and this is really where I'm going with this. They have a letter of intent. This document is 70 pages. Um, it includes a number of, uh, of extensive uh, appendices. And it really includes all of the details um, of the plan for the medical school. Now, I'm not going to run you through all 70 pages because we'd be here for a while, but I am going to take you through uh, the table of contents because it, it is instructive. Um, we are seeing there that they have done uh, the background work, the alignment with vision, what an approach to a medical school can look like, the unmet needs, what is it that we're trying to do, um, factors, uh, contributing to uh, these, these unmet needs. They're looking at the region in which they intend to be practicing, um, and they're looking at ways to admit and train differently. Like, they have given this a great deal of thought. Moving along, this is a three-page table of contents. Um, we're seeing that they have given a great deal of thought to the curriculum and how it uh, will respond to what we saw in the first, to the, um, the research that they've done. Um, they've compared to other programs. They have looked at, at how to use technology, mode of delivery, um, team-based approach to care. They've done all of this work. They have um, vision, mission, and values. Um, and they've got this all written down. And then they've got you know, the details of the MD program itself, um, admissions, curriculum, uh, modes of delivery, which is uh, a question that we have, and, and their conclusions, and then a number of appendices. I want to take you to the UPEI website for the School of Medicine in contrast. This is essentially the content that has been on there since it was announced. We have a general, a blurb. This is content, um, but really not much detail. And uh, so I'm just going to take you through the three pages. Uh, there's this. I will tell you that none of those are links. This is this is graphic, but there are they're not links. You can't click through to anything. And actually, if you go down further down the website, there's a, a link for program development that sends you back to the front page of the university, um, rather than program development. So, and then here's the the end of that. Why a joint program with MUN? Um, and this is all good information. <coughs> Um, but it doesn't provide us with the kind of detail that uh, we would expect at this point. We're less than two years from taking students in into this program and, and something like eight months from accepting applications. Um, and, and what we're seeing is that there's a great deal that we just don't know. And as I said, that makes it very difficult for us to evaluate what the impacts might be. Um, but I can tell you the things that we don't know that we'd like to know, that we're concerned about. And one is the financial plan. Um, it has been made clear in recent comments by the interim president uh, in the media and uh, in some meetings that there is uh, a separate funding agreement for the medical school, likely with the government. Um, the details are not clear um, and, and nothing has been made public. That's in stark contrast to um, our funding agreement for the rest of the university, which I believe was presented to a standing committee in the fall. Um, so we do have questions about how that works. Um, and uh, what he said is that it, the model is very similar to the AVC, uh, which uh, we have questions about because the AVC has a very unique funding structure that includes funding from uh, four provinces, which we don't think this, this school will have. Um, and we don't under, they're saying that it's walled off from the rest of the university, and we don't understand also how that can be, um, because they're also making a lot of the, the, what they call the collaborative aspects of the program, which is that it will collaborate with existing programs, including nursing, paramedicine, uh, the uh, doctor of psychology, and other allied uh, programs. Um, so we, we do have questions and concerns about, about how that financial plan will work and whether it will be bleeding money away from the rest of the university. We don't have any understanding of the structure of the school at all. 
Um, it was originally announced as a co-degree with uh, the Memorial University of N Newfoundland. Um, it was clear fairly early on that we would be using their curriculum, at least from early on in the, in the um, beginning. Now we're being told, and this again is comments made in the media, uh, that it is going to be a regional campus, what, what we think is a satellite campus, uh, with most of the teaching delivered remotely by MUN faculty. Um, which is a substantial departure from the MUN um, curriculum that I don't believe MUN teaches remotely. Um, I'm unaware of a medical school that, that delivers the first two years of, uh, of teaching uh, remotely with faculty in a different province. Um, we're surprised, frankly, that the accreditors have been agreeable to that, and we would like to understand what this means. We've all been through a pandemic. Uh, I taught remotely for two years. I taught HyFlex for two years. I'm here to tell you it's not much fun um, and it's not a great experience for learners. And I teach music, which is much lower stakes, but the outcomes for that kind of applied uh, teaching are, are not as strong. And in medical school, that seems like, like that would be a problem. Um, we'd like to understand what, what that means. Um, we also have questions about, they're saying that there will be a small number of faculty here. Who do they work for? Are they, are they MUN faculty? Are they UPEI faculty? Um, the MOU with MUN has not been made public. We have no details of the agreement with MUN. Uh, we have no understanding of the role, the responsibility, and the liability of UPEI in this arrangement. We don't understand if there is any kind of a cost-sharing agreement with MUN or with the province of Newfoundland if, for instance, our students have to go and do their residencies there and presumably then not stay in PEI. Uh, we don't know who manages operations. We don't know who is paying the dean and who the dean will be reporting to. Um, as I said, we don't know who the faculty who are in province will be reporting to and who they will work for. Um, there are a great num large number of, of details that, uh, that have an effect on the university, have an effect on our members, um, and we don't have any visibility at all to what they might be. And of course, as Dr. Arfkin said, even UPI does not understand how the crucial health system integration piece will work uh, because they don't have that report yet, less than two years before we actually start the program. And they by and large are not inviting health stakeholders to the table to discuss concerns. And I know we've heard a lot in the news about what that looks like, but I, I wanna give you a different example today. I've been talking quite a bit to people across the province, trying to understand what the impact of a medical school could be um, on UPEI. And last week, um, I had a meeting with the leadership of the Queens County Medical Staff Association, which uh, represents the QEH doctors. It's 300 odd doctors at QEH. Um, and they wanted to talk to me because we're the faculty association and they are expecting to be clinical faculty in this school. And um, in our discussion, they showed me correspondence. We had a, a long discussion about their attempts to uh, be part of the conversation. They are the people who will be doing the teaching. Um, and they are the people who know what is going on in our hospital right now. And uh, they have concerns, they have ideas, they have things that they want to bring to the table, but they have been unsuccessful at, at having the opportunity to do that. They have not been invited into the process uh, in any real way. And they were asking me if I knew how to get them in front of you, and I said I would tell you about it. <laughs> so um, so I, would, I would encourage you to invite them because I think that that's an important perspective that is not being heard and clearly is not at the table um, at UPI right now. And unfortunately, this pattern of systematically going around people or groups who raise concerns of, as uh, has been uh, characterized, making it a zero-sum game of people who are against or for with no gray area in between, is familiar to us at UPI. And it is unfortunately a very destructive pattern. It is not a good foundation on which to build a university, let alone a medical school. So then the question becomes, what do we know? Um, and I can tell you from our perspective at the Faculty Association, it, what we know is that UPEI is undergoing an extraordinary amount of instability right now. We know that uh, from a financial perspective, we have significant uh, structural funding challenges. 
Uh, our, our, the provincial grant is less than a third of our, our total budget at the moment, and we're largely reliant, it appears, on international student tuition, which is notoriously unstable funding. Uh, you never know what's going to happen in some part of the world, and of course the government could decide, as indeed they have, to cap visas. This is bad news for us, and it, it highlights the extent to which this funding is unstable and, and not a good foundation for a strong university with, with a sustained mandate. Um, even with that, we also know that the university is currently underfunded. We know that we are seeing, uh, those of us who are delivering the, the mission of the university, the teaching, the research, um, and the people who are supporting the students, which are the staff, we don't represent them, but we certainly know them well. Um, and we are all struggling with under-resourcing. We know that we don't have enough academic staff. That is a conversation that we've had publicly. The university has not, not disagreed with that. Uh, we have programs that are struggling to deliver uh, their programs. We have students who struggle to get the courses they need to graduate. Um, some of our faculties are, are at as little as half of their optimal staffing levels. We have really, really low full-time staffing levels for a university of our size. Um, and the struggles, particularly in upper level courses, uh, happen even in heavily enrolled programs. This isn't something that's happening just in programs with a few students, it's happening across the university. Um, and it's a significant problem. From a governance perspective, as Dr. Arfkin mentioned, we have had an interim president for more than two years. Um, and with all due respect to the individual, that means that major decisions about the direction of the university and evidently about potentially the impact on our health care are being made by someone who has never been through a formal hiring process or review. We have a new board chair in the last year. We have a large number of new board members. Um, and in fact, we had a, a, a very vacant board for quite a long time. Just this week, the university announced that we will be undergoing a comprehensive governance review by an outside firm. So UPI could look very different from a governance perspective in the next few years. Um, that's, that's a lot to take in all at once. And of course, the elephant in every room that I walk into these days is the response to the toxic environment described in the Ruben Tomlinson review. That response uh, needs to be long-term and sustained. It will be difficult. Culture change is difficult, and it will be expensive. So any one of these three challenges, the financial, the governance, uh, the response to, to Ruben Tomlinson, would be big projects for a university on their own. Uh, together, they, they create a picture of, of incredible instability. We really don't have a foundation. And to layer on top of that uh, a, universe, a, a project like the Faculty of Medicine, which is incredibly complex, is going to be massively expensive, has to be done collaboratively, um, is really an extraordinary lift for a university, any university, but for a university uh, facing the challenges that UPI is facing at the moment. Finally, um, I would like to just address, I know that many people have pointed to the Atlantic Veterinary College as an example of what UPI can do. I want to be clear that uh, we love UPI. We're here because we love UPI. We, we have extraordinary colleagues who, and students who do extraordinary things every day. Um, and the AVC is a, a really great example of what we are able to do. Um, and uh, although it does have its challenges as well, it isn't a good comparator for a medical school. Vet colleges and medical schools are not the same thing. Um, but I, I did find it instructive to take a look at the planning process that was put in place that happened before the AVC uh, came to be um, and compare it to, to what is happening now. And I'm going to have to go back through my slides because of who I am as a person. There we are. Um, so I'll run you through it very quickly so that we have time for questions. So um, the AVC took its first set of students in 1986. Uh, the first, the public announcement by the province of PEI that they were uh, considering a bid uh, to, to be studied by MPHEC uh, to, to host that school was in 1974. 50 years ago this year. Um, that is a 12-year process. You can see uh, that it was extensively studied, MPHEC, that's the Maritime Provinces Higher Education Commission, studied it extensively and looked at several sites in the four provinces. 
before choosing, um, and that was a two-year study, before choosing UPI as, as the best option. There was substantial discussion. It was the Howell Report. There was substantial public discussion. It was made public. Um, after extended discussion at the end of 1976, I was two years old, uh, the uh, PI Institute of Agrologists passed a motion supporting it. So that's the beginning, really, of getting it going. That got to, took two years. Two years after that, and to be fair, there were four provinces involved. There was probably a fair amount of political wrangling, but uh, they hired Dr. Reginald Thompson, who eventually became the first dean of the AVC, to do the research required to determine the feasibility. So this is the feasibility study that started in 1978, uh, that was commissioned in 1978, started in 1979, and I can tell you was actually delivered in 1981, although I didn't put that in there. Um, and... Um, and then after that, the, the funding agreement was signed two years after that and three years before the AVC opened. Um, so the, the feasibility study in that case was done five years before the first intake of students. You compare that to, and, and what I've got there, and I, I, I know you've all seen the slide deck, so you can click through to, um, to these. This, I, I've done this. Um, this is from the UPI newsletter at the time, which was called Topics. That I'm, I'm not doing deep research here. This is freely available archival material. Um, here I went through cbc.ca. So the UPI Faculty of Medicine planning process in 2019, um, you may recall that the, the Faculty of Medicine was actually floated as an idea during the 2019 um, provincial election. And in December 2019 is the first that we hear from the former president of the university that, he's that we are looking into medical school options. That was the first that we heard of it. Um, in October of 2021, just about 18 months later, they announced that they were going to be creating it and that it would be opening in 2023, um, which is, is funny to think about now. Um, in March of 2022, not surprisingly, they, they delayed the opening one year, but to 2024. Um, and in February of 2023, they finally commissioned the Health System Integration uh, Capacity Study um, which is now, we now know as the Spindle Report, to, to give us an opportunity to understand how, what the feasibility of this project would be. Um, I've added a, a story there to uh, just remind everybody that uh, concerns have been raised really for quite a while by the medical community. The, the PI health system may not be able to support the medical school. That's the medical society saying that. Um, so that's, uh, it's, not, it's not a recent concern. It's... it's um, it's been going on for a while. In February of 2023, which is a busy month, uh, we delayed the opening to 2025. Um, and of course, in October, we appointed a dean. So that's where we're at. That's, that's where this project is. Um, and again, we don't, we don't really know what, what's going on. It looks to us as though UPI is putting the cart before the horse in this case. Um, and unfortunately, as I said in the beginning, the stakes here are very, very high because it affects our only island university. We don't have a spare in our back pocket because it affects our health system, which is in very precarious shape at the moment. The consequences of getting this wrong are significant. And the costs of getting it wrong are not only financial. This will affect the lives uh, of islanders in a great many ways. Um, and that's why we are pleased to be here to give you our perspective today. Thank you. So we'll open the floor to questions. Oh, wait. We'll open the floor to questions. Um, and we're going to start with Gord and then we'll be Peter. Um, thank you very much. Thanks for coming in. That was very um, educational and informative. And as always, um, you know, I know that the faculty um, has been through a lot the last couple of years. And, um, you know, there's so many good people that love this school. and and wanted to do well, and I think that we're all in that, that position. Um, you, you, talked to, you, you talked a lot about, you know, good ideas are simply not good enough, and, and there was a few different other things from there. When, when was the last time that you, or have you ever spoken to the president directly, or, or people in, that are putting this together? The Faculty Association has never spoken to um, the university about about this and and what came out of those meetings, if any. Uh, we have never been invited to speak with the administration about this plan. Uh, we did in a uh, we have what's known as a joint committee meeting, which is a, a meeting with a VP and a dean and myself and and, and Margot. 
Uh, in that meeting, we did raise a question. We said, will people uh, who are teaching in the school be in our union? Because that's useful information for us. And they said, maybe. And that was, that was the extent of the information we've gotten from the administration. So no, no, we have not been invited to, uh, to engage with the administration on this uh, at all. Gord. Um, yeah, and it just seems like, I, I think that's probably maybe one of your asks is, is that the communication start. I mean, it's a little bit late at this point, obviously, and I think, uh, what about the province? The province has, has fully supported this and, and understand, have you met with the minister about this or the premier about this? Uh, has he approached you about, hey, this is going to be good for the faculty and, and everybody else? What, what involvement have you had with the provincial government on this plan? We've had no, no involvement at all. We really are not involved at all in the development of this from any perspective. Gord. And I guess talking to your staff, I mean, when, when this is coming, a lot of money is going into this. We see, we see money at, at the local hospitals. We see, um, I've actually got the budget. I've actually got your budget in front of me. And there's, um, you have your core operational grant. It's um, $39, $39 million. Uh, $39.6 million. And then under there, it, it talks about the Faculty of Medicine. And in there, budgeted in 23-24 was $3.999 million. Um, but that's not in your core. It's, it's separate. And for, do you know anything about how that money was spent or what that money was for? It would be speculative for us to respond to that. Um, we do know that we have people on, on salary right now. We have a COO. We have a number of support people. We do have some directors developing. Um, but, um, other, you know, we know what you know. The, the way that I know who's working for us is by going to our website. Mm -hmm. Gord, do you have a question still on the same line? Um, sure. And, and just to touch, and I'll, I'll ask questions later because this will be my last one, is that, that that's, I asked questions recently about the restricted funding. Restricted funding for AVC is, is money that we get to run AVC. It's restricted. It's, it's there because it comes in from other provinces. It comes in, it's supported by, and it's, it's about $10 million um, now. And the president has mentioned that, that the medical school should, could be part of that restricted funding, but I don't think we're getting any funding from other provinces. I think the restrictions are just I'm, I'm not, I'm not too, so you, because you know what I know, so I guess I'm asking you, um, that becomes an important thing for a faculty association because is the med school going to become part of the faculty association or is that going to be restricted to as well? <clears throat> what are some of your concerns around that that you would want um, both the province and, and uh, management to hear? I mean, certainly we'd like more information. We'd like uh, a budget outlined. Uh, helping us understand, you know, they say that money may not be coming from the, the budget for UPI, but where is it coming from? Is it, is it coming from money that could be spent in other areas of our healthcare system? You know, yeah. we have concerns about that as well. Yeah. Uh, in terms of our members, you know, people are going to be brought in. Uh, some of them are going to be affiliated with Health PEI. Some of them are going to be affiliated with us. What are the, you know, in terms of the Labor Act, what is the dividing line about their ability to, to engage in, in certain activities? Because some people are restricted from that. Mm. Uh, that's useful information. Um, also, when people are meeting with us to interview for positions, we need to give them a sense of what they're likely to encounter and what environment they're likely to be in. And, and not knowing these things, it's hard to provide that information to potential applicants. If applicants don't know what they're getting into uh, from the get-go, they may not stay. Uh, and so it's a, it's a circular process that, that really could be uh, addressed uh, from the front end, but, but it's not. Did you want to add something? I was going to say, if I could add on to that, from the financial perspective, um, one of the worries that has come to us a lot from members is, is the sense that, um, yes, it may be separate budget, it may be, um, it may be totally separate funding, but that um, you know, the government is going to be looking at UPI and saying, we're, we're putting money to UPI. Um, so what's the problem? And, you know, we are already facing difficulties, difficulties running the university. We have 5,800 students right now, um, and we don't have what we need to deliver the programs that they, you know, are paying us to deliver. 
Um, so we're worried that that will get worse because the government will look at it and say, well, we've given X number of dollars to UPI. That ought to be enough, but really that it's going to go to the university, so to, to the medical school. So even if um, it's walled off, and I don't understand how that can possibly be, but even if it's you know firewalled from the, the, the main part of the university, um, it certainly can and likely will, and probably already is having an impact, I would say. Yeah, great. Thanks. Good answers. Thank you. Do you back of the yeah, list? Okay. Peter. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Margot and Mike, for being here this morning and for the amount of work you, that you obviously put into making this presentation for us today. We heard a lot that we have not heard in this conversation and a perspective that's been absent, so thank you for being here. I want to start by concurring with a couple of things that you said right off the top, um, that we want to have a strong, healthy university and we want to have a strong, healthy medical system here on Prince Edward Island. And, and those two things, um, I think one of you put it, are both potentially in jeopardy if this is not managed well. And I also appreciate the fact that you emphasized the possibility of having a nuanced position regarding this project, not whether it's a good or bad idea, um, because you can be supportive of the potential of a medical school whilst pointing out <clears throat> um, challenges that exist, uh, or you can, you can express deep concerns but acknowledge the fact that this in the long term may be a useful thing to have here on PEI. So I appreciate that. I appreciate that because it has become a binary um, conversation at times. Um, whether or not this is a good, a good or bad idea obviously is unknown at this point in time, but what I think we can say with absolute certainty is that this is a very bad process. I think we are, we're not even following the most basic tenets of project management protocols and, um, and norms. And therefore, we have so many unanswered questions. And it's not fair for me to ask you questions that you have no more information to than any of us sitting in this room. And that's, to me, a huge problem here. One thing I, I think it was you that mentioned this, Margot, was that there, this is not the only example of, and I, the words you used were mismanaged and under-resourced. Maybe it was Mike, actually, in your opening remarks. And I'm wondering if you could give us other examples at UPEI that you would describe as being ideas, good ideas, uh, which were ultimately mismanaged and under-resourced. You want me to take this? Okay. Um, I think... Um, it's a bit of a delicate question. You know, in the last uh, several years, we've expanded a great deal as an institution. We went from, I think, six faculties to 10 or something like that. Um, and in the last few years, we've added, uh, in particular, the uh, Faculty of Sustainable Design Engineering, which on, it sounds like a great idea um, and, and likely was a great idea. Um, but which is a program that um, it's, it's not meeting its enrollment targets. It is struggling to deliver the program. It's struggling to hold on to faculty. The resourcing has not been there. Um, another example is climate change, um, which, you know, really vitally important. I mean, I can't think of anything that is more, more sort of timely um, and in particular really highlights why it's important to have research capacity for PEI on PEI. Um, because we saw with Fiona that, that you know, the, the work that the climate change and adaptation program is able to do um, is, is vitally important to us. But again, you know, that is a faculty with very few faculty in it, um, struggling to, to deliver um, programs and, and really not, not finding its footing. And that's not a reflection on the program. It's not a reflection on the people in it. In fact, they are doing heroic work. Um, but, but these are programs where we put up a building and we made an announcement, ribbons were cut, um, and then um, when it came down to hiring people to deliver those programs, uh, we have faculties of one at UPI in some cases. Um, another, unfortunately, is ICARIS, the Indigenous faculty, um, has, uh, I don't believe we actually have any tenured faculty in that, uh, in that faculty at the moment at all. 
Um, and so, you know, these are important faculties. They are, they are not just good ideas, they are essential ideas. They are essential to, to the moving forward of our institution, um, but they are not currently being properly resourced. They were not properly mm -hmm. planned. Mm -hmm. um, and and that, that makes a difference. That affects, you know, it's not enough to, to make an announcement. You have to put the resources behind it. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Chair. A fundamental question, and, and I don't know the answer to this. I'm going to ask you, and uh, again, I'm not sure whether you know the answer to this, but who is in control here? Um, is it government? Is it health PEI? Is it the university? Because somebody ultimately is making decisions on this, and that may be a different body from the place where the funding for this is coming. So I'm, I, I, I'm wondering who you think is in charge here, who's running the show? It's a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> and if you I don't, don't know, like that's fine, exam. because <laughs> well, it's a fundamental yeah. question. And yeah, it is. I, I don't know the answer to that, and that's really worrisome. I think one, you're right, we don't know, but I think one way to sort of discern that is to look to who is unwavering in their commitment to this project and unwilling to address critiques of this project. And when I, when I look for those people, it tends to be uh, senior leadership at UPEI and, and the government. Um, those, are the, those are the entities that in their communications seem to um, not have time to address legitimate concerns that people have about this project. That's, that's what I would surmise. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Carl and I met with reps from uh, management at U UPEI uh, just last week, actually, um, the interim president, uh, Paul Young, who is the COO of, of the medical school, and the two newly appointed deans, Preston Smith and Dolores uh, McKean, I believe, from Munn. And w we spoke for an hour, and it was an interesting conversation. And at the end of that conversation, I, and you referenced this in your presentation, I was left um, uncertain as to whether we're actually talking about a standalone medical school, as, which is what I had always imagined and been led to believe this was, or whether it is a regional or satellite campus, whatever terminology we're going to use. Um, do you have any clear indication at this point whether which of those two, or perhaps an, another model we're talking about here? So. Um we have kind of an idea, and again, we don't have anything in writing, so I, I can tell you what I what I am understanding, um, which is that I believe the plan um, is to start uh, is to start as as a MUN satellite, is to start as um, as a, a MUN degree, so that I believe, and this is really conjecture, but in, in that case, I think that the um, the degree granting institution would be MUN and not UPI. Um, and then I think that the, the plan from there would be to, to seek co-accreditation uh, for a co-degree and then potentially to move uh, to a, a, single, a single degree from UP, P, UPI, although that, that hasn't really been discussed. Um, one of the things I want to make clear is that's actually not, a, it's not an unusual model. We've seen in, in the region, we've seen um, some schools of, some faculties of nursing in particular have been have been set up this way, um, and uh, the one that I'm thinking of is CBU, where I believe the Faculty of Nursing. I'm trying to remember where they came from, um, but um, I think it was Saint FX, and and they started as a Saint FX program at CBU that became a co-degree and then moved on from there. Um, the key difference in that case was that there was faculty at CBU. What they're proposing here is a remote degree. Um, so it's a satellite campus with, with almost no faculty on the ground in province here. And, and that is extraordinary. We've never seen anything like that. And again, I'm telling you what I'm getting from, you know, having attended a number of meetings where Mr. Young and, and Dr. Keefe have spoken, and I'm figuring it out from what they've been saying. Um, but we, we certainly don't have that in writing. And I, I would also, just, just to bring up the, the problem with transparency and, and accountability when, um, when in a recent Senate meeting, 
they raised the, the term regional campus, um, a member of the curriculum committee for the medical school uh, expressed surprise. It was the first time they had heard that term in relation to the medical school. Um, they were aware that we were going to be using the MUN curriculum, but they didn't realize that we were going to be a regional campus. And that, that is significant, I think, that, that the people, even the people who are on the inside, who are at the table, uh, don't really have a, a good sense of what's going on. And I'd like to add to that. Um, a, a project like this has to be approved under the University Act by Senate. And in fact, uh, I was in the discussion on, on Senate when this was being, uh, when this was brought to Senate. And uh, I, I remember at that time, the former president was assuring senators, no, this, you know, there was some pushback. They didn't have enough information. And so he was saying, uh, well, no, it's just, to, it's just to kind of look into the idea of a medical school. And so people, the senators were like, OK, I feel, I feel a bit more assured. And so they went ahead and, and voted on the motion. Next thing we discover, we have a medical school. Um, and then what happened, uh, so you ask about this, this, regional, uh, this regional campus. Um, again, that would be a decision I would envision as something uh, to be made by Senate. But that has never been made, brought before Senate as a decision. Uh, my understanding in the last Senate meeting is that a number of senators pressed uh, senior administration at UPI to hold a special meeting of Senate so they could ask specific targeted questions about the medical school. And UPI leadership largely shot down that idea. Uh, there were enough senators, so it was passed, and so at some point there will be a special meeting. But the fact that senior administration is not even supporting the, the academic decision-making body of the institution having a, a prominent role in this project, I, I think is deeply concerning. Um, so the fact that we're now learning that it's a, it's a regional campus or something of the sort, uh, that's, a, that's a conversation I would have imagined would have happened at Senate, who's, who decides uh, academic, academic decision matters. And in fact, it, that was not the case, to my understanding. I was there. Yeah. Peter? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I mean, all, all of that is just so deeply concerning. And uh, there was somebody who appeared before this committee a, um, a couple of weeks ago now who said something to the effect that we're not, you know, this is a medical school, not a fried chicken franchise. And, uh, you know, that perhaps is an unfair remark because I suspect that those who are franchisees for a chicken franchise, for a fried chicken thing, would do a lot of research into the governance and financing of setting something up and making sure that it was sustainable and strong and based on a strong foundation. We were told last week at the meeting we had with UPEI uh, management that the school, the building of the school, is on time and on budget. Now, I have no data to question whether that's the case or not. Have you ever seen? any projections on the timeline? This is just for the capital build of the school itself, itself, for the timeline and for the expense associated with that? So, I mean, what we know, uh, I, again, I, I, I guess I'm the person who most recently went wandering through cbc.ca archives. Um, what we know is that uh, the costs, the capital costs, have m almost, I think almost doubled since the, since the project was announced. Um, and uh, I believe the delay of 2024, from 2024 to 25 uh, was, was, it was said that that was because the building was going to take more time um, to be finished. Uh, so that's, that's what we know. Um, whether it'll be finished in time for a 2025 start, I don't know. Um, and, you know, the, the medical school building is, it's a bit of a red herring, I think, because it, it, it is not the only... Um, physical facility that we need, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, what um, what has been raised it, in front of this committee over the last few few weeks is that that we obviously are going to have to do uh, a lot of building of student spaces across across the health system as well. Um, and I'm not aware that that has even been proposed. Um, so it's that's not clear to us in terms of, but but the building itself, the one on our north campus, is it certainly is is going up there. And I want to follow up on something you said. You, you've mentioned a number of times meeting privately, essentially, with UPI administration. Are they, have they been invited to this committee? Are, are they going to come forward and, and speak to this committee? Because Well, it's up to the committee. And um, the committee determines who they invite in to speak. So anybody can put forward that. And then the committee decides whether they come or not. Okay. 
I, I would just strongly encourage yeah. the committee to invite yeah. 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 Okay. So are there? Okay, good. Excellent. Yes, they have been invited. Excellent. Okay, good. Thank you. Peter, do you have a Thank final you, question? Uh, yeah, you could put me back on, okay. I, um, but right. I, I, I'll ask a, a question related to what we've just been talking okay. about. Um, in your slides, you talked about the, uh, the comparator in Ontario, where the timelines are, are remarkably similar, uh, that they have a clinical partner identified. Um, is MUN not the, would that not be the parallel institution that we're talking about here, or are we talking about something else? You mean in terms of the clinical partner? Yeah. Uh, no, the clinical partner is is the the place where you do the clinical teaching, right? So so there's what we call didactic teaching, which is what happens in in the classroom, and and you know we have to be clear. I like I I have doctorates, but they're in music. I'm not a a, a medical doctor, and so I've gone around talking to a lot of medical doctors over the last few months, trying to understand. What's needed here, and um, and you know what they tell me is that you know the first day of medical school they dissect hearts, um, so you need hearts. I mean, I, you know it's co it's complicated and it's hands on from the start. Um, that clinical component is important and it starts at the beginning. Um, if for Mun to deliver that without bringing health PEI into it, because that is who runs our our what would be our clinical sites in PEI, the students would have to be in Newfoundland. Um, so I think the question maybe you're getting at is, is the agreement between Health PI and UPI, or is it really between Health PI and MUN? I don't know the answer to that. We have not seen the MOU, and we don't know whose responsibility it is to deliver that under this agreement between UPI and MUN, and that, that is a, a big, big question that yeah, I, don't, I haven't seen anyone even ask let alone address. So it's, uh, yeah, we have a, there's a lot we don't know. Um, and we're concerned that maybe nobody knows. Thank you. Chair, and thank you so much for, for coming in today. You've presented a lot of, a lot, you've posed a lot of important questions and, and have brought a lot of things to, to our minds clearly. And I'm noticing kind of a flow to, to the questions being asked here today. But I guess I would start by, pointing out, you know, the difference between the two planning processes. There's not even a comparison. You know, the Atlantic Veterinary College planning process, on paper, looks like it was fairly well thought out, the steps were taken, and then you flip over to the medical school planning, and it's just looking into the options, announces the creation, delays opening, um, and then a report being commissioned, um, and it's just... There is no, that is not a planning process. That is just initial conversations as far as I'm concerned. So that is, among all of the other things you've presented, extremely concerning and irresponsible. And given the fact we don't know who is in charge, that is one of the hugest issues we're seeing in healthcare right now is a lack of transparency, a lack of accountability, and therefore, who is in charge? Who is responsible for things? And I'd like to point back to the, the meeting that was held in Summerside on the Prince County Hospital last week when the minister was questioned about a very specific uh, incident where a, a medical doctor wanted to come to PEI and health PEI never got back to them. And the minister's response was, give me their name and I will look into it. That tells me right there in that very answer that governance is shot because there is no one who, what the minister should have been able to say in that moment is, oh, I'm going to talk to the person responsible for that and see what's going on. That should have been the response. Because the number one issue we have in health care in Prince Edward Island, as has been highlighted recently, is politicians' fingers in the midst of it, which is very much happening here, given we don't know who is making decisions, but we know the two for driving forces behind it. Having said all that, one of the things that I was talking to about a constituent yesterday, it was, a, it was a brilliant idea that I'm trying to figure out how to move forward with it, but this idea of flowcharts. While seemingly very simple and maybe not important, it is very important because then we can see who is responsible for what and how can we ensure that they're being held accountable for their role. And so here we've got this medical school, which everyone can see that there are issues with, given a report wasn't commissioned until fairly later in the process. So 
We don't know who's responsible. We don't know who's making the decisions. So a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago, the UPEI Faculty Association had sent out two letters, one to the Board of Governors and one to the, the Senate of UPEI. And, and after having spoken to, to members of, of both of those places, I'm given the very, um, and I'm wondering if this is, I guess I want to get clarity on this. D due to the fact that this seems to be no longer just a UPEI thing, that it's very much a satellite program from M Memorial, is it fair to say that Senate doesn't have any say over that, given it's not uh, specifically a UPEI program? It's my understanding from the latest Senate meeting that that was the message that was conveyed, but maybe you can... That is essentially what they what they said, and I mean, well, Mike can talk more about go governance at UPI, but, um, you know, if it's not a UPI program, then I'm not really sure why we're here. Um, it, it was announced as a UPI program. It's, it's, it's being, you know, the, the messaging all came from our interim president. Uh, it's on our campus. It, they're telling us it's going to involve uh, many of our programs. It, it is intended to at least become a UPI program. So, so there's that. Um, it, it, the question of who the degree granting institution is, is like, that's a big one. Um, when you talk about an affiliate program, um, you know, I think it is appropriate for the Senate to, to uh, decide to, to have discussion and, and make decisions and, and, and some oversight over, over how that happens and, and what decisions are made. Um, again, you know, to say that we're going to be um, delivering a program that is largely delivered remotely is, seems to me to be a, you know, there's a quality question there that I think that UPI ought to have some, some sort of um, ability to speak to given that, that those are in, envisioned to become our students. So what they're saying, and this is, this is the part that's really kind of murky to me, what they seem to be saying is they're going to start out as MUN students, but by the time they graduate, UPI's name will be on that degree. It's not clear to me if the first run of students will just be MUN students. Like, we don't know any of that, but it's on our campus, it's in our province, it's being funded through UPI. UPI hired a dean. Um, it's being, all of the public comment is being made by the interim president of UPEI. The decision making on this is being done by the senior leadership of UPEI. Um, UPEI has committed significant funds to this. Um, I will say that, um, and I think we raised this in our letter to the Board of Governors, they recently approved uh, a $60 million line of credit to help finish the building. And we're not clear, we, we didn't get a lot of detail uh, on what, what that, how that was funded, where it was from, how we're servicing that debt, and why. Um, but um, but that, like that, those are expenditures coming out of UPI's budget. I don't know how we can say that it's not a UPI program. Um, and that, it, so if they're saying that, that UPI Senate has no purview over it, um, I think that they have not made that case. Um, I will also say, and, and I, Mike could go on for a while about this, that um, this is not an unusual way for uh, senior leadership to treat UPI Senate. We tend to get stuff at the last second. Um, it, it, it has been treated as a rubber stamping uh, organization. And, and the letter that Dr. Afkin sent was very much, you know, asking senators to take on their responsibility as, as the, the stewards of the academic mission of the institution. The University Act charges them with that. Um, and it is you know, possibly the most important job on our campus. So I'm not sure that I'm answering your question, Carla. I don't know, I don't know the answer. Um, but, but I don't think that the case has been made that there's no purview for Senate in this case. And, and something I want to I want to raise that you, you brought up the leadership. Um, keep in mind, we're currently in the hiring process for a president of UPEI, and I believe a, a health CEO, a health PEI CEO. Um, one of my biggest concerns is is the criteria for actually getting these positions going to be an unwavering commitment to this project? That's not the type of person that we want in these leadership positions. We want someone who's ready to to take criticism, someone who's willing to weigh evidence and and figure out the best path forward for our post-secondary education institution, and for our health system. And so we're, we're, there's a lot of upheaval and a lot of change. 
Um, there's a quote by Upton Sinclair that says, it, it's difficult to get a person to believe something when their paycheck depends on them not believing it. Um, I find that we, we're very likely to be in that sort of situation where the people that are occupying these leadership positions have occupied them because they already have a preconceived notion of how this project is supposed to look. And I think that's dangerous. Thank you, Chair. I, I would agree. And, and I guess I asked, that, I asked that question about the UPEI Senate, just trying to get a sense of you know, the places where we have the opportunity to provide some oversight over this seem to be getting blocked. And so I'm just trying to figure out that process even who, of the responsibility there. And the other letter that you sent was to the Board of Governors where, um, so I guess I'm wondering from that letter, and it, correct me if I'm wrong, because I meant to print it off before I came down today, but you were asking for financial info or information or due diligence documents from the Board of Governors. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, if you've received a response to that. So I did receive a response from the chair of the Board of Governors who, uh, who thanked me for the letter and uh, agreed that she would share it with the rest of the members of the board. Uh, and they are meeting next week, and I'll be attending to see how those things go. Uh, one of the reasons for that letter is I attended the previous Board of Governors meeting, um, and I, was, I had become aware at that point that they did have a copy of the Spindle report. And they were, uh, the board was making uh, decisions and, dis and was having discussions around the medical school. And it became clear to me in those decisions and discussions, it did not appear that all the members of the board, and I'm not even sure many of the members of the board had ever seen this report at all, yet they were making these decisions uh, about the medical school. That's deeply concerning. The, the Board of Governors, which exercises oversight over our institution, should have all the information it needs to have those discussions. Uh, the fact that I could see them sitting there having discussions which appeared to not be informed by this report was, was deeply concerning. And so that's, um, that was part of the reason uh, for that letter. I just want to add to that one, one thing. To be clear, uh, we have not been invited to attend Board of Governors meetings. This, uh, they are open to the public, and that's, that's why Dr. Arfkin is able to go, that we're not, we're not there as invited guests and being brought into the conversation. Correct. Thank you, Chair. And I guess I've said it once, if I've said it once, I've said it a million times. In what other world would it be okay to move forward with a project like this before having your docs in a row and having that report written to consider all of the aspects of this? Because like you've said, it has become very binary. It's either you're for or you're against. But that's not fair. As you consider, you know, the, the, the CEO coming forward with concerns, Doctors coming forward with concerns. I've had doctors reach out to me about this with concerns. And yet, you know, we're kind of being assured by government and by UPEI um, senior admins that, oh, no, this, like, we didn't need that report. Like, this is fine. And, and I, I, I just don't, I don't get it. And I never will get it. And so I guess at what point, what would be um, the... Uh, I guess I, I had a question written here, and now I can't find it. Um, okay, I'm going to change that a little bit. The Spindle report, you had said that it was Health PEI who released it to you and not UPEI. I'm wondering if you have any insight in that and why UPEI, given they were the ones who commissioned the report, um, given they're the ones pushing forward, you would think that they would want to release this to alleviate all concerns, because when you're moving forward with a project like this, when concerns come up, you need to be open to those. You need to reassure people um, that you've put the time and effort into that. So I'm wondering if you have any insight into that. So I have a lot of experience requesting information from public bodies in this province. And um, I have never experienced the lack of transparency, the barriers, and the obstruction with any other public bodies um, compared to the obstruction I face with you from UPEI. Uh, a number of years ago, I requested information on health and safety in the midst of the pandemic. They released 40, 50 documents. I, I told them that I didn't think that was enough, that there must be more there. And uh, from pressure from the privacy commissioner here, we ultimately learned that there were 35 hundred plus documents that shed light on a number of health and safety concerns at UPEI. So this is not unusual. 
When I make health, when I make information requests at UPI, uh, sometimes they go unanswered. Sometimes we get uh, documents that are completely redacted that we can't make heads or tails of. Um, I find nearly every other public body in this province incredibly, uh, well, not much more transparent than what I face at UPEI. So when I, when I put in that uh, information request uh, and I put them in simultaneously to Health PEI and UPEI, the fact that I didn't receive a response uh, from UPI until after Health PEI had released it uh, was not surprising. Um, and the fact that I received an unredacted copy from Health PEI um, was, was what let us, let us understand things that we could not understand or could not have understood otherwise. Um, so it's, that is the climate that we're working in. We have an employer who likes to tout uh, their transparency post Reuben Tomlinson. And uh, I can tell you sitting here that that is not the reality. Um, things, have, things have not changed with respect to transparency uh, in, in the way that I think is being described to the public. And that's deeply concerning. And just to clarify again what, what Mike has said, when he says that um, it wasn't, that they didn't respond, he actually means that they failed to respond. They didn't even acknowledge. Um, we didn't even get the email that says, yeah, we've got it, we're working on it. Um, we didn't get anything from UPI. They, they, it was a deemed refusal to, uh, to address. So, so the contrast between those two is, is stark. Yeah, Carla. Thank you, Chair. And I guess my last question for this round. Um, if you had a magic wand, this wa magic wand cannot go back in time, it can only move forward. What would happen moving forward here from both the perspective of government and UPEI and whatever else you want to throw in, what would you like to see happen right now in good faith moving forward with or, or not with a med school? It's my least favorite kind of magic wand. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm no fun. I mean, I have ideas, but I know uh, you do as well. We'll so. both do. Yeah. That's a difficult question because uh, we're so far behind the eight ball at this point. Um, but I think, as I said, you know, it, it is possible to do this well. Um, and I think everyone has said this. You know, it's, I don't think anybody has said, and it's clear to us, we've had this discussion um, at, the, at the Faculty Association. We're past the point of no return. This is happening. Um, you know, and it's not that medical schools are bad, um, but that they have to be carefully planned. And so I think at this point, what, what we would want to see is the time taken uh, to get this right. It is not too late to do that. Uh, we don't have to start in 2025. Yes, we will wait lo longer for doctors, but uh, we will also maybe not have such a strong effect on, uh, on the healthcare system as it tries to recover. We would be giving the university an opportunity to, to sort itself out. Um, and I think that um, you know, taking that time now um, would mean that we would be much more likely to be successful um, in the future. So I think, I think this is the time to press the reset button, as I think someone said in The Guardian this week. Um, and, and this is the time. I, I think we, we have a window of opportunity here um, to, to slow down and get it right. And, uh, and we can't get it wrong. That's the thing we cannot afford, is to get this wrong. Because as I said, the consequences of getting it wrong are significant. Um, and they are not only financial, you know, they, this will affect people's lives. It will affect the ability of people to get an education in, in PEI. It will affect access to health care in PEI. Um, that's, those are very serious consequences, and, and it behooves us to be careful about our approach. I think the people right now who don't feel like they have a voice need to have a voice in these discussions. Um, we've, we're dealing with uh, groups of uh, our leaders who are suggesting that they're following an evidence-based approach. This project should not move forward until there is unequivocal evidence that it will not impact Islanders' access to health care. In the absence of that evidence, we need to take stock of what we're doing and figure it out until we can make that guarantee that Islanders' access to health care will not only not deteriorate, but will actually be improved. Um, if we can't make that commitment, then we need to pause and think about what we need to do so that we can make that commitment, in my view. Thank you. I'll put you back doors. Thanks. Court. Okay, yeah, this is uh, very interesting. And I, 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 I too, met with, with uh, UPI about this, and that was my very first question. 
is that that period between the opening of the med school and when the graduates come out, um, how is that going to affect access to health care, access to um, people? Obviously, we need people to teach. Obviously, we need people in the system. And that was my very first question. And obviously, um, it hasn't been relayed to you. So I guess that's, I just wanted to compliment you on, on that too. Um, just, just moving on, I think government hired a liaison last year, um, one for Holland College and one for UPEI. Now, this position would seem like it was, it's a perfect position to what government's direction is and what we're talking about here today. Have you talked to or do you know who, who that person is and have you discussed any of these issues with that liaison person? So, uh, liaison to what? To the University of Prince Edward Island. Would that be the Board of Governors liaison? Uh, I, trainer, right? I, mm, yeah. I, I don't, I, I, I don't. I, I think we're answering your question, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have not spoken to that person. Yeah. Um, but I'm not sure, I, I've heard about a liaison from uh, government to the board in the, in the wake of Reuben Tomlinson. Mm -hmm. um, we're now hearing some, some, some rumblings of some other things, but no, we have not been engaged with mm -hmm. that person. Or invited to engage. What 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 we were made aware of was somebody who from government who had been brought in to sort of help the board assess its its needs in a, from a governance perspective, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so we presume that that's going forward. But we've we've not met or heard from that person mm -hmm. at all. And I guess we in a meeting. La uh, it's just it's just odd that I just find it really odd as as I keep thinking about here in this meeting that that that. There's been no communication. When, when we had, we had a, a minister uh, in, in cabinet in last week talking about hiring practices, uh, or people people coming in and jobs going to different people. You have not had any correspondence with anybody who's who's been associated right now with the with the medical school faculty in your positions at all. I've sent, I believe I've sent letters to people uh, raising concerns, but I would not, I would not had any correspondence or conversation. I mean, I think. There might have been a candidate meeting. Um, we meet with all, all candidates um, for tenure track positions at UPI, and I, I, I believe we met with uh, somebody with candidates for a position that was going to be eventually a co-position with the Faculty of Medicine, but that's the closest. Yeah. We've, we certainly are not in on the conversation in any way, shape, or form. I, and just actually something to mention too is that we've we've been reaching out to our counterparts at Memorial University, so the faculty associate, association over there, since apparently they're going to be playing a role in, in teaching in this program, and and so far we haven't been able to get much information. Yeah, they don't know much more than we do. Uh -huh. so. Great, and I get. I guess that, that that's the problem. There's four players: there's the government of Prince Edward Island, there's MUN, there's UPEI. Okay, and there's health, health PEI. Mm -hmm. And the meeting I was talking to you about was when, um, you know, Dr. Garnham came in and said, I, I would like this candidate, uh, you know, be, to be considered uh, for a liaison role. And, and then, so I, I was, d does that position come from health PEI? But at minimum, it needed to be addressed and p you needed to be talked to about what was going forward. Is that what you want in the future? Is that your, your, at the table as a faculty association to figure out where where we are, um, how we can help this, how we can help this process go go forward, and and moving on that the communication and be be documented, written, and uh, forthright to your organization, to your association. I think it's really important to distinguish consultation and meaningful consultation. The faculty association on a number of areas has been brought in to have a conversation with UPI administration which they then checked off their box on consultation and continued to do whatever they were planning to do anyway. So we're not looking to just be brought into a meeting uh, so that they can say they consulted. Um, we speak for the people that teach at UPEI. Um, they need to talk to us if they're going to be doing things that impact that or if they're going to be drawing on the resources of our members. Mm -hmm. And that consultation has to be meaningful. Yeah. Um, we have to we have to have felt heard. We have to see changes based on the things that we're talking about, mm -hmm. not just bringing us into a room and checking off a box. Mm -hmm. To go to that, though, I, just to go to what I was saying earlier, we're not the only people who are not at the table, um, and um, and when you're when you're trying to put together a project as complex as this one, 
uh, you really need everybody at the table um, in, a, in a meaningful way and not just you know, being briefed on what's going on, um, but raising concerns, raising questions, testing ideas, right? That's how you get from, from start to finish on good ideas. Mm -hmm. Uh, the best ideas need need proof. They need proofing, um, and uh, and so that's not just the faculty association. Um, it's not just health PEI. It's not just the Queens County Medical Staff Association. It is everyone, um, and it's really vitally important to get the the dissenting voices. And I, I I don't mean dissenting in the sense that you know we're against it, but the people who are raising concerns. Uh, those concerns need to be acknowledged and addressed. There may be good answers for them, mm -hmm. um, but, um, but being able to, to sort of work through that as a group, we may have all the answers, but right now there's only one group that's making the decisions and that's mm -hmm. the problem. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, do you have another question? Yeah, um, I guess this would be my final one for this section, but you, you had mentioned too, and. Again, I have the budget here, and you mentioned that the provincial grants are less than one third of our funding. So, I, and I look at the numbers, and I remember because I've been there for three years, and I remember if you take a few certain key areas out, it, it was almost like UPI was. I said this too was being cut, or the the, the funding was flat at very minimal mm -hmm. during a time of of where inflation was 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 unbelievable. Uh, it was a stagnant line there. Are you, and I guess with the future too, with, with some announcements, various things are going on. Well, you mentioned it before, a large portion of our, our students are international students, which is very imp important. What do you need from this province in terms of the budgets coming down in March this year? Um, it'll be very interesting. What do you need in terms of budget increases to operate as a faculty? I mean, what, like, it's kind of an open-ended question, but if you could just talk to that for a little bit. I'm gonna start. Um, so the, in terms of the, the number has been flat, essentially, for quite a long time. Um, and yet over the last 10 years, our enrollments are up more than 30%. It's uh, close to 35%. Um, and so yes, we've become very reliant on, on international student tuition and fees, um, and, and that, so that, that's really, you know, we have a decision to make as a province. Uh, what do we want our, our institution of higher learning to be? Yeah. We only have two, we only have one university. Um, and trying to picture PEI without UPI oh. is, is a disturbing idea, right? To think that the kids would all have to leave to get their undergraduate degrees, to think that we could not attract uh, anyone to come to a job where they might want to take some additional courses, professional development, an MBA, something like that. Um, not having a strong UPEI outside of the Faculty of Medicine is really unthinkable for, UP, for the province. Um, and so, you know, I'm not the person, we're not the people who have the numbers for you. No. We, we'd have to sit down with that. But, but $39 million dollars, out of what we've been told is a $163 million budget this year is a very small amount of money. Um, and, and as I said, we know that, that whatever we have, it's not enough or it's not being spent properly. We don't know actually very much about the budget either because the books aren't really open. Um, but, um, but no, there is, it is time, past time in our view for uh, an extended discussion. And, and I will say that I've actually reached out to uh, senior administration at UPI to say, you know, like, w we don't see eye to eye on everything, mm -hmm. um, but we certainly see eye to eye on structural underfunding of the institution, mm -hmm. and we would be more than happy to work with UPI to advocate for this. It, it matters. Um, so that's, uh, that's really all we can say. And I, I do want to highlight institutional autonomy in a post-secondary context is a double-edged sword. It's absolutely vital for universities to be independent from government, to not become arms of government and, and things of that nature. Uh, so, so we have to keep that in mind, but we also have to recognize that you know, more money for our institution is important, but how that money is actually spent is as important. Uh, is it being spent on lawyers' fees? Is it being spent on silencing victims of sexual harassment? Is it being sent on expensive communication strategies to paint a picture of UPI that doesn't bear any resemblance to reality? 
I mean, those are the sorts of things that we have to ask. We, we need leadership in there that is not going to look at the next legacy project or not look at some expansion project, and is going to look at the basic infrastructure of our institution. We need infrastructure investment. We need more faculty. We need things that are going to go directly to helping our members deliver a world-class education. Um, so it's not just about funding. It's how that funding is being used. Excellent. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, yeah. And, I, and I, I, would, I would agree. I'll just add to that. I would agree. And, and that's why I'm, it, it's so vague when we get, when we get it in here. It's just, it's just $40 million. So we're, we're, and then there's restricted funding and different things in there. So I would agree. And I guess that's a, that's a you just made a, a, a clear sign that the money has to be directed in the right way. Do you know how the, um, the that, how much money that the university spent on lawyers to, to battle various cases of the, the past? If I don't have a specific figure, but if I look at uh, the its its activity with the recent round of collective bargaining, which involved all campus unions, uh, that extended process, what we saw with the, the stuff in the Ruben Tomlinson report, uh, I, I don't have an exact figure for the legal expenses, but they have to be unbelievably high. Uh, at, a sa at the same time when we were struggling to basically, in the last round of negotiations, we were struggling to get mental health supports for our members, which would have been a drop in the bucket, uh, and which is what they refused uh, outside of a strike. Um, it's, it's extraordinary. But no, to answer, I don't have a, a specific number for that. So. To, to clarify, uh, we do know they've said that the, the cost of the Ruben Tomlinson review was $400,000. We do know that the board was represented by its own legal firm. We have university lawyers. Uh, Stuart McKelvey represents UPI. And what, what Dr. Afton is referring to in terms of negotiations is that their chief negotiator was um, a lawyer from Stuart McKelvey uh, for a full year of negotiations with all four campus unions. Uh, I don't know what he bills, but it's more than what I bill for sure. I'm going to go back to uh, the comments right, at, right off the top. I think I referenced them in my first round of questioning around maintaining a strong and stable university and strong and stable uh, healthcare system. I'm going to start with the university. You mentioned the dwindling, and, uh, and that was just discussed in your round of questioning with Gord, the dwindling percentage of public funding which comes from, you, from the provincial government to the university and how our dependence on international students and the higher fees that they pay has become sort of baked into the, the finances of the university as much as we can see what's going on. And I'm wondering whether the recent federal announcement regarding turning that tap not off but back a little bit, uh, whether you feel that that will have given the, well, I guess a, a straightforward question, what percentage of students at UPEI are international students, and is that a disproportionately high amount compared to other universities in Canada? It's roughly 35% this year, um, and uh, that's up from the last few years. Um, you know, I haven't looked in the region. I know that um, my memory is that when, when COVID hit, because when, when, when the pandemic happened and we couldn't bring students in, everybody panicked, um, that at that time, I think Cape Breton University had the highest percentage and they were at 30%. And that was considered a danger point mm -hmm. in that context. So, um, so yeah, it's a, significant, it's a significant amount of, of our budget. And you consider the, the amount that they pay, it's, it's, a, it's many, many, many millions. It's most of the rest of our budget is coming from, from that. Um, okay. yeah. Peter. Thank you, Chair. Um, and, I, and I have heard reports, although I've done no research myself, that, that this change in the number of international students will have a disproportionate impact on this region. But I, d I don't know specifically what that means for UPEI. Um, You've mentioned the phrase a couple of times, Margot, that the medical school is somehow financially at least firewalled from the rest of the university. And, and like you, I'm not quite sure what that means, given the integration of, the, of some already existing faculties and the fact that there will be a medical clinic in there providing services to um, university students and faculty in there and, 
and their families. What, what is your understanding of, of that? Because here, again, I'm trying to look at the potential financial impact of the medical school on the rest of the university, on the faculty, on the students, on the ability to provide courses in other areas. What's your understanding of what this terminology, and you've sort of touched on this, but I'm just offering you an opportunity to expand on it, what that terminology firewalled means? <laughs> that's me again. Okay. Um, that's, it's a, that's a very tricky question to answer because, again, um, we have to be clear, the books are really not open uh, in terms of we don't see a lot of granular detail in terms of the budgets at UPEI. Um, the um, interim president, who is who is the former dean of the ABC, so you know he naturally kind of reaches, I think, for those those comparisons. But um, he has said that it is it is it is walled off from the rest of the university in the way that the ABC is. So that's what I'm basing my understanding of his comments on. Um, my understanding, our understanding of, of how the AVC works is that it, it has its own, its, its own funding, it's, it's restricted funding that comes from the provinces, um, and, and it kind of its own bucket of money, um, and it has to work within that. It is not able to take money out of, uh, out of the main university budget in order to run. Um, you know, when I talk to people at the AVC about how true is that, uh, like, it, it's on our campus. Uh, there are faculty, their faculty are our members, you know, like it's completely integrated. And the fact is that, um, that it, it, you know, it pays, it pays the rest of UPEI, um, for instance, for, for heat and electricity and things like that, right? So like, it's not a completely separate set of, of calculations. Um, and it's hard to imagine that in the context of sitting down and looking at the UPI budget when, when the president of the university does that, when the, the governance committee or, or the finance committee of the board does that, that they don't consider both of these things together, that they're, they're saying, okay, well, let's deal with AVC and then we'll go and deal with, with the university. But there's also perception in terms of government. And that, as I said, this is a, um, the concern that our members have raised quite a bit is that idea, that, that worry that, um, you know, so we have this, this, okay, so the money is walled off, but, in, you know, in terms of budget lines for the government, it says UPEI on it, so what's the problem? Mm. Um, and when you say that it's walled off, then that, you know, that, okay, so, but that's money that's going over there, and we're, we're already seeing a little bit of that. Um, we are hearing concern from some areas of the university that are already being asked to expand the, you know, in, in anticipation of the medical school, but who are feeling like the resources are really being put into the medical school and not into the allied programs uh, quite so much. And so again, you know, if, if the um, smooth running of the whole project includes the allied programs that are part of the rest of UPI, and it's a, that's a terrible way to, <laughs> to talk about it, um, but if, you know, then, then there has to be crossover. You cannot separate those things. Um, so what, what the plan is, what they may be hoping will happen, um, the expect we have no visibility to that at all, um, but it is difficult to imagine a project of that magnitude on our campus interacting with our programs and, and not having a, um, a financial impact on the rest of the university. And, and I'd like to add to that. this. This way of going about things is not unusual for UPI administration. It, years ago, and we continue to push on this, but years ago when we first had concerns about the Egypt program, uh, we would ask questions about, you know, about UPI and relationship, and uh, oftentimes there would be a distancing exercise. Oh, it's, it's, not, it's not UPI, that's over in Egypt, and it's not, it's not a UPI campus, but then you see the way that it's being built here. It's a UPI campus and UPI degrees and stuff like that. So what we found with UPI administration is, if we ask questions that seem to be within our purview, it is then pushed out of our purview so that those questions no longer can be asked. So, oh, the funding is, is, is not even linked with the university, so that's not in your purview. Um, it's, a, it's a regional uh, MUN campus, so now Senate doesn't have anything to say about it. There's, there's this kind of push and pull where when, uh, when questions get asked, there's a, there's a distancing, uh, but then you'll see in a lot of the rhetoric that that distancing is closed. And so uh, this, is, this is something we've dealt with uh, in a number of other instances. So I, I don't think people should be surprised. 
Peter, can I just put you back on the list because we have to finish up in about seven minutes. Sure. And there's two other people. Absolutely. Uh, that are, that are wanting. So yep. if we have time, I'll come back to you. Right. And I'm going to go to Robin and then Carla, and we'll see where we're at. So, Robin. Well, thank you both for coming in here and uh, and talking to us today. Uh, all kinds of questions uh, that uh, doesn't seem any of us can answer. Um, I'm a little confused, though. Is your issue today with government, the medical school, or UPEI administration? Uh, it seems in your conversation that your relationship is strained at best with UPEI administration, and I'm curious as to why and for how long. So I guess my first question would be, what do you suggest as a solution to rebuilding your relationship, the FA's relationship, with UPEI senior management and governance, and what does a healthy future look like for the FA? Do you want, I, you want to start? I can start. You start, yeah. Um, in our conversations with UPI administration, we have heard a lot about, um, uh, more in the past, because we haven't had a lot in the way of conversations more recently, but in the past there's been discussions about uh, the relationship and the need to heal the relationship. Um, one of my concerns is that we can, we can quote-unquote heal a relationship without actually changing the structure in which we're working. Our concern is that we want to see our members supported, we want to see them respected, we want to see them given the resources they need to do their jobs. If UPI becomes willing to do that, then I think our relationship is going to be great going forward. But I think focusing on the relationship at the expense of looking at the under-resourcing and mismanagement that we're dealing with on a daily basis I think that that focus is in the wrong place. Um, the relationship will take care of itself if the people that are doing the work at the institution are supported and able to, to do their job. Yeah, I, to build on that, I would say that, you know, it is the role of the faculty association to speak for our members and to speak to their concerns. Um, and. The, as an employer, UPI has a, a choice about how they, how they approach what we are and how they take what we are saying to them. Um, when we say to them, you know, we, we, are, we are facing challenges, we need these tools, um, how can we, we work? And I want to be clear that, you know, we have quite good working relationships with, with a number of people in senior management at UPI. Like, it's not... We're not at war necessarily all the time. I, I, I get along really well with the VPAR. Um, but, um, you know, when, the re when, you, when you go in with um, a series of, of legitimate concerns, like we can't deliver a program over here, we have students who are, who are crying for courses, um, and the response is, you know, we don't even want to talk to you, how dare you bring this to us, right? Like the, to close the door, again, it becomes zero sum, a zero sum game, right? That, that, there's there's a choice being made not to engage, um, and and it's symptomatic of the problem that we're seeing with the medical school. So how do we heal? I mean, we've certainly heard that that question a lot. Um, and to be clear, I feel like maybe you're you're reaching back to the strike, which is fair. It was a four week strike, which is fairly extraordinary, um, and uh, and. There were an extraordinary number of communications unsigned from uh, UPI that were really denigrating the people who do the work of teaching and research at this institution. They don't feel good about their employer right now. Um, so certainly there is work to be done there. I don't know that, that I feel that, that the overtures need to come necessarily from members of the faculty association. But as I said, I have, you know, we are, we are willing to do what it takes to get to our, our means, to our end, right? Which is happy faculty teaching happy students. That's what we want. Um, that is, it is our job to represent them in that. <laughs> and we are more than willing to have open and honest and transparent conversations with anybody about those things. We certainly have nothing to hide. Thank you for that. And it does sound like uh, you guys have some work to do to rebuild trust amongst the two parties and for whatever reason. I wasn't going to bring up the strike, but uh, I'm glad you did. It uh, cost our students a lot of uh, educational time and a lot of money. So that uh, I'll leave my 
my comment on that there. There's been a lot of criticism in the room uh, today and talked about, and one that, uh, that concerns me is uh, you're questioning the ability of the professional body that is tasked with accrediting medical schools, as well as MUN's ability to deliver the quality programs that they are famous for. Uh, can you comment quickly on that? Uh, yeah, I, 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 uh, I disagree with the characterization that we're criticizing. We are questioning what is actually happening because we don't know. Um, we certainly acknowledge that there may be excellent answers to all of our questions, um, but but they're not being they're not being offered. Um, and in fact, even asking the question is is being treated as as you know unfair, being against it in a, in a very binary way. So um, we're certainly not questioning what MUN does. It's, you know, they have a program and it works very well. We certainly are not questioning um, the accreditor's uh, ability to assess the program. Uh, we, are, we are curious about, you know, what they may know. We are curious about what they may have been told. Um, and I don't think, given the magnitude of the project, that it's, it's uh, too much to ask that um, they submit what, you know, this to, to the, the view of, at the very least, the UPI Senate. Um, but, you know, if, if there's nothing to hide, if there are no problems, then let us see everything, as we have seen at other universities. There's, there's nothing secret about this. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, why not, why not tell us? Robin? Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, one last question. Um, the FA, what was your involvement and did you share similar concerns when the climate school was opened, the sustainable design engineering school was opened, the expanded nursing school was opened, the National Research Centre or the AVC? What was your involvement in those projects and what were your concerns? Were they similar to today? Did you voice them? I. If memory serves, almost every single one of those projects was before I was involved with the faculty association. Okay. So I don't... Well, it actually, some of them are before there was a faculty association. Um, so we did not voice any, any objections to the AVC, although, uh, you know, it was a controversial project at the time. Um, the, the, as, as Mike said, we, don't, we weren't, neither one of us was in leadership at, at the FA at the time of those. Certainly there were um, questions raised about, you know, in a similar vein um, about um, the expansion of engineering into a faculty, um, where the resources would be coming from. That was a big, big question. Um, and, and in fact, we did see that resources got shifted around and, and some, some departments lost positions, right, because they went to engineering. Um, so, so that was, uh, climate change was a bit different because it's a school, it's not a faculty, um, and so it's a school of the Faculty of Science, and, um, and so it's, it's uh, a little bit different. There certainly were questions uh, about particularly the, the outlay for the building and the, the, where the building is, you know, the fact that the, it's based in St. Peter's, which we don't object to, it just is a long way from main campus for undergraduate students to be driving. Um, but there wasn't, to be fair, you're right, there wasn't the fulsome discussion around those things um, that we're seeing around the medical school, but we're also, the um, impact of the medical school is, is, and the complexity of the project is significant compared to, to both of those as well. Okay, uh, I thank you very much. I know the faculty has been in existence since I think 1969, so there would have certainly been the opportunity to engage. I thank you very much for coming in here and sharing your thoughts and uh, mm -hmm. the time in your day to talk to us. That's it. Thank, thank you. you, Carla. Thank you, Chair. And, and I guess I would start my last question by saying asking questions and sharing concerns is a crucial part of any project. And if we can't do that without getting defensive, maybe this, that, that should be concern on its own. So just that for now. Um, my last question is about the office on Belvedere Avenue that's been established for the Faculty of Medicine. We know that there's 10 people there right now and that they're expanding to five. Um, sorry, expanding by five to 15. And um, so wondering about the salaries. Uh, Dr. Gardam had told us that two members have left health PEI because wages are 30% higher there, and um, I'm wondering where that operational funding is coming from for that office. 
I do we have any? No, we don't know. I mean, I, I don't think any of our members would be. In, none of our members would be. In no, that, no, in, we don't. That, we that. don't have that. So, yeah, mm. yeah, we don't have that information. Right. Sounds like we're robbing Peter to pay Paul a little bit. Anyway. We don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Are you? Okay? Uh, yeah, I realize the time, Chair. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, I, I guess on, on behalf of our committee, thank you for coming in and sharing with us today and answering all of our questions. I know sometimes it can be a little bit overwhelming uh, when everybody's kind of asking a lot of, of you to answer. So thank you for coming, and um, we'll just, if it's okay with you, we'll just carry on just because of the time restraint, and we'll allow you if you want to collect your stuff and leave. If you want to stay and listen, uh, we'll leave that up to you. All right. Okay. Thank, you thank, you thank you again. Thank for you for having thank us. You. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. So we'll just carry on um, just because of the time. Uh, under new business, I'll turn it over to our clerk um, to bring forward some information. Um, sure. Okay, my mic's on. Um, just looking for... Um, February 16th is a Friday in the afternoon. Uh, the committee had invited the nurses union in to speak with the committee. Uh, and that is a time outside the committee's regular meeting time. So if that time works, we can, it's Friday, sorry, Friday, February 16th. We're looking to book a meeting with the nurses union at 1.30. Everybody okay with the nurses union at 1.30 on Friday? I'm unavailable on Friday. Here for that one though, but if it's if it is what it is, I mean we need to fit it in, in as of tight timelines. Then unfortunately I'll have to miss it. But yeah. available on the 16th either. So yeah. so that's two. I'm still not okay, so that's three. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll have to get that one rescheduled. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I will have um, Sam, the regular committee clerk for this committee, coordinate with them to see when they might be available. It might be after the house sitting at this point. I don't know if there's any other availability next week for a committee meeting. I think we can leave that up to Sam. Sure. We're all good with that. Okay. So uh, I guess I'll ask for a motion well, to. No. Oh wait. Sorry. That was new business, right? Is there any other new business, I guess, I should be asking? Uh, how? I'm not sure if it's new business or not, but is this basically on, uh, you're going to give us this a recap on the format of tonight's meeting. Like the public, uh, how is that going to, um, is there, what's, what, how is that going to work out for public who are wanting to speak um, at that meeting? And, and has the minister um, responded with his attendance? Um, to, to answer your last question first, I can't confirm if he has attend if he has confirmed his attendance, but I can check with Samantha and send a note around to the committee on that after the meeting. Um, so this evening, the format is going to start off with a presentation from representatives from the East Prince Medical Staff Association, as mm -hmm. that was the committee's yep. priority. Um, I we did put you know out to the public. So I'm not sure if Samantha has received communication yet from members of the public if they were wanting to present to the committee. We will have staff there tonight that will basically be greeting people as they come in. If people indicate that they're interested in presenting, we'll put them on a list. And so following the presentation from the East Prince Medical Staff Association and questions, it will be opened up to the, the public to come forward. So anybody who has put their name on that list, we'll just go um, in order of their names. If we've already received some interest from people to present to the committee, we'll call on them first and then we'll, we'll continue calling on people um, until we either run out of people on the list or run out of time at that meeting. Okay. Um, question again about that. So how long did you, how, how much time did you uh, allocate for the presentation? From the East Prince yes. Medical Staff Association? 20 minutes. Oh, it's 20 minutes. Okay. And then how much time is there for us to ask I questions? I think she put an hour and a half. Okay. Or just to be As asked a whole. clarifying questions. Okay, and then it's open to the public after that. Yeah, and we decided um, at our last meeting that the next presenters would be given five minutes with okay. a few questions afterwards. Okay, thanks. Yes, yeah, so we'll have staff on site to help facilitate those that are interested coming forward. They'll give their name. That staff member will pass it on to the committee clerk, and so the chair and the committee clerk will kind of work together to keep everything straight for the public. And there the have public. been a few people that have reached out from the public okay, to speak. Um, and so to confirm that meeting is starting at 6.30 at the credit union place. 
Um, so if um, the presentation is 20 minutes plus the time allotted for questions, that brings us to about 8.30 and then there'll be time, about an hour and a half for the public to come forward. Anybody else have a question? Gord. Oh, no, not a question, but just okay. maybe something to bring up under new business. Yeah. Okay, is this still on? Oh, we're still on that? Okay, well, yeah, well, because I think Peter has a question yeah. as well. No, is that, oh, it's a new question? Board, okay, have, go ahead uh, then. Do you have another continue question? Continue on now? that, and it's back to the minister again. So a letter was sent to the minister asking him to attend at this meeting. So we haven't heard back from the minister whether he will, whether he even acknowledged that receipt of the correspondence or whether he's attending or whether he's not. I've just sent a note to the committee mm -hmm. clerk for this committee asking for clarification on that. So when I hear back, I will, if it's at this meeting, I'll let you know. And if it's afterwards, I'll send an email to everybody as soon as I have that information. Yeah, but I guess what I'm trying to say is this was uh, a motion that was put forward with that ask. We should have heard back by now. We should know by now whether or not uh, there was a response. Well, I think that we don't know because we haven't checked with Sam. She may know, but we don't know. So I think the clerk is saying that as soon as she finds out that information, she will email that to all of us and let us know what the um, answer is. And anyway, I guess I give up on that because it's, it's concerning because it was a motion put forward by this committee. There should have been a response today as to a receipt of that correspondence or any further correspondence uh, from that initial um, ask. So I think what we're saying is as soon as she finds that out, she'll let us know. Gord? Yeah, um, I just want to see about writing a letter to the, the, the minister responsible for public safety. Um, you know, we had quite the, the, this last snowstorm affected the island in very different ways, and there was a lot of, I'm hearing a lot of information coming out that a lot of people were in a desperate, desperate positions various, various times throughout the province. Um, but yet we heard there was a couple tweets out from uh, emergency measures and, and um, maybe a Facebook message. And I want to know wh what was the criteria not met to, to inform the public from emergency, emergency measures office. And um, that letter would go to the minister saying, did we not meet the criteria or did, was, it not, uh, was, was it not a big enough uh, storm for them to take action on? I want, I want information and correspondence as to why the information coming out of our government was, was, was not substantial. Robin? What minister do you want that from? Minister responsible for emergency measures. And Voiced, uh, uh, wait, sorry, Gord. Justice and public safety. What does that have Robin. to do with this committee? Are you asking me? I am asking someone. It's uh, part of the previous mandate. So this is the committee. Justice and public safety. It yeah. is, okay. Yeah. So this is relevant to this. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't getting off the rails here. Okay, what, what, Gordon? what happened with off the rails was, was cars and driving into to whiteout conditions and, and, and people stranded in different places. That was, that's what was off the rails without any correspondence from our government. Robin? There was quite a number of Correspondence this went out. I believe RCMP, I believe our website was telling people to stay home and stay off the road. I've seen numerous ones. Very, very unfortunate the people that did get stranded. But I'm not going to argue about this one, but mm. I just. I, gu I guess you're making my point Gordon. for me. It was disjointed, and we didn't hear uh, we didn't hear correspondence. If the RCMP was, was doing what they could, and everybody else, and the emergency firefighters, and and various people in the community were there, but the communication, in my opinion, was lacking. A coordinated communication was lacking from a provincial standpoint. No comment. Robin. No comment. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so as a committee, do we want to send a letter to Justice asking for them to talk about the emergency measures response in this last story? Talk about and are we looking for a written response in return? Is that... Uh, it's, Robin? It's certainly worthy of conversation, there's no question. I mean, it's always good to be better informed and better prepared for the next storm and the next storm, so I have no yeah. objections. Okay. Objection. So we will ask the clerk to send off a letter then. And a written response is adequate for this 
first uh, request. Okay, Peter. Uh, the guests that were in this morning mentioned that they'd been, uh, they'd had a conversation with the QEH faculty association the staff at the hospital, basically, and that uh, they they would suggest that we invite them into the committee and given what, what I know and having spoken to some of them myself, I would agree with that. So I'd like to move that we ask for representatives of the QEH um, Faculty Association to come into this committee to talk about the impact of the medical school on the hospital and on the medical um, system generally. Okay, any discussion on this? Gord? And I'd like to further that. There was some, there was some um, discussion too, uh, I would agree with that, but there was some discussion around MOUs. Um, can we uh, write the university about any MOUs and, and what, at least what they have? Uh, is there any MOUs with Memorial, with Health PEI, and with the province about the med school? So, right. So we'll just hold on to that for a second. Okay. Let's so deal I'm with what Peter has uh, brought forward. And his motion is, do we want to reach out to the QEH and invite them in to speak? Does anybody have anything that they'd like to say on that? So my question would be, um, given the timeline and, and that we are running out of time, um, are we okay if they aren't able to come until after we sit? If that's the only time we can get them in. Can sure. we leave that to... Um, our regular clerk to find out if there is a time and if there isn't, are we okay with having it be after sure. that point? Peter? But just comment, I, I, um, and I'm sure Sam will do this, make every effort to get them right. in before the sitting, but if it's absolutely impossible, of course, okay. we'll do Thank it afterwards. You. Thank you. Nobody has anything against that? Okay, so we'll get that done. Now, Gore, did you have something you wanted? Oh. All those in favor of this motion? All those again? Gord. Oh, just I was I was just saying any information on um, uh, MOUs that that have been signed um, and correspondence to this committee about uh, they were our guests were talking about um, not not being not uh, having any information or want to know what MOUs were signed uh, about the uh, opening and the the start of the med school what MOUs are in place with the province with the university with MUN and with Health PEI. Right, so I'm going to just ask the question of clarification. I'm not sure, is this a letter that you want to send to somebody and who do you want that sent to? Yeah, it's, it's a letter. Just uh, obviously we don't know who's, uh, it can go to, it can go to the province. I think it can go to the minister. The minister should know um, what MOUs have been signed. I would, I would think it would just go to the minister of uh, Early earnings and not early learning, but um, advanced advanced education there. Okay. So, so the MOUs between the province and UPEI or the province. Who, who, what? what it can go to the it can go to all four really, but I was just saying for a coordinated, the minister should know about what MOUs are going if we're spending um, a huge amount of, of uh, taxpayers' dollars on the preparation for this, what MOUs are in place. It could also go to UPEI. I mean, that would take care of, that would take care of uh, um, that. Okay, so is this something we want to have sent out as a committee? Hilton? Clarification, yes. I just don't yeah. know. Can <laughs> you back up some gourd if you could? Too much going on here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm just wondering, um, are we still talking about emergency, emergency measures organization? No, about, uh, okay. 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 Uh, Robin, do you have a comment? I was trying to and... Again, does this fall under this committee's mandate, or would that be more of an education thing? Like, we're talking about, are we talking about QEH or UPEI MOUs from them? Who's who do you want to? Court. Um, it, it would be the, 
I, I guess that question is part of the problem. Um, we just spent two hours talking to guests that don't have any idea about who the MOUs are signed with, and that was made reference in, in the presentation. So um, this is affecting health, and it's a med school, So, but I know it's run through advanced learning. You're, you're correct in that. But I think that this, this committee is dealing with the med school, so I guess it would be MOUs in, in relation to the med school. Um, so that's why it would be under this committee. Carla? Just a clarification question. I'm wondering if maybe this would be a, a good starting point. Next week we said that the UPEI administration, I forget mm -hmm. the, the group that's coming in, would it be a good, par a good starting point to ask them for the memorandum of understanding to see if they could provide it and then if not, dig in a little more? Because they may, they very well, I would hope that they would have them all. Yes, you sure can. I just want to clarify for the committee that we there is a briefing um, about the UPEI funding agreement, and it's to the Standing Committee on Public Accounts. Um, just to make that clear, um, it's a different committee, uh, but that uh, there are representatives from UPEI coming in. Uh, Dr. Greg Keith, the, the interim president, uh, Tara Judson, vice president of administration and finance, interim, and then also the chief operating officer of the Faculty of Medicine, Paul Young. So just to clarify that it is public accounts that they're coming into. Um, and I know most members are kind of crossover to that committee. And if you don't, you're also welcome to attend if you'd like to uh, listen in on that presentation too. And that's the morning of the 16th. Can I just put it under the table to say that can we just hold off on that and maybe we can bring that forward at a, at a later time when we have more time and that um, after this other briefing? Are we okay with just pausing? Right, think, so yeah. I'm putting it out there to ask if people are willing to, what we think about that. Peter? Chair, I'm actually in, in favor of sending a letter off asking for documentation, if that documentation exists. I think we can do that independently and won't take any committee time to send that off and I'd love to see it. Okay. Do we have any more discussion on this letter? Just to confirm, it will be going to the Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population requesting any um, MOUs in relation to the medical school at UPEI. So that kind of covers wherever the MOUs are going, kind of just an umbrella of anything related to the medical school. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Can I get a motion to adjourn this meeting? Adopt. Can I get something? Can I get a motion to adjourn? Yes, thank you.